Hi there folks, welcome back to the channel, thank you very much for joining me once again. You are always most welcome. Now today, something that I know one of the viewers and subscribers has just been building himself. I think he wasn't having a lot of fun at it. I'm trying to remember what he told me now about some problems. But anyway, we'll let him comment in the live chat in due course. It's the F3D2 Sky Knight. Now this is a sort of Generation 1 jet. Um, that was developed uh, in the USA really is a sort of a trainer a bit, a bit like an American Jet Provost to those of you that know the Jet Provost it's kind of their answer to that sort of application where it can also be used as a ground attack aircraft and it was done, it was used in Korea so uh, there's, a, there's a Korea option on the back which I will show you in due course it's PK-134 it's a rather strange looking aeroplane it's like a cross between a, I don't know it's a bit, it is a bit like a Provost to the uh, the cockpit's a bit like a provost, and the back reminds me of a... Uh, what's that remind One of the naval aircraft. It reminds me of two or three things all at the same time. A little bit of shooting star in there as well, T-33. Yeah. Anyway, now this has uh, been loaned to the channel by our good friend Chris Doney from Bridgewater in Somerset. It's a very nice part of the UK indeed. And it's sealed, and I feel a bit guilty about this, but he's, um, I'm going to try and open this in a way that minimises the disruption to the outer packaging. So I'm going to try and basically cut out a slot to withdraw it from, because I don't really want to destroy the whole of the uh, packaging for him. But he insists it should be seen, so let's have a look at the back. And you can see you've got the uh, <laughs> Miramar in California, which of course is the home of Top Gun. And this is back in the 50s, of course, here. Whoops, got a lot of shine on this. So we've got here uh, the VF-121 at Miramar, California in 1958, is that? 58. Um, and on the other option, and that's obviously the training plane, you know. Um, on the other option, you have got the Sky Knight, which is being used at Pyeongtaek in South Korea. Can you see this? Um, it seems that that one, uh, they don't show the, the wings the same. I don't know why they show it in a different manner. That's a bit confusing because I'm not sure. I presume it's just a black scheme like a night ops machine. Um, yeah, I guess that's what it is. It's a night ops thing going on there. But it doesn't show the wings. There's no overview of the wings or anything, which is kind of strange if you think about it. Anyway, we won't get too uh, flummoxed about that. Let us just have a look, see if I can operate on this very carefully and not wreck it for Chris. So you might want to just talk amongst yourselves for just a moment or two while I carefully try and get in here. I think this is the best way in. Yeah, then. It's like watching a surgeon at work. Chris, just look away for this moment, yeah. That's right, oh, yeah, there we go. There we go, here we go. Mm, easier said than done sometimes. Easier said than done. I think we're in. Yeah, 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 we're in, we're in. This is looking good. Okay, that's done. And down the side. You can see why that motorbike took me 250 hours now, can't you? <laughs> I think we are. Looking positive. I think we might be in business any second. Are we in business? Yeah, we're in. We're in. Oh, it's so difficult, we don't want to. I'm going to fold it back and avoid it. So tricky these boxes are sometimes. Sometimes it's best to just get your finger in and flick it out. Like that. There we go. All done. It, actually, the reason it was hard is because they've done rather a good job. If you look very carefully at the flaps. Um, they often didn't use to glue them, but then the later ones, as you can see here, they've been glued. There's these circles where they've got hot melt glue been applied there uh, and they did it rather well he's wanted to be the chance to open it but anyway we're in and we have minimised the cellophane disruption so that's all that we got now of course this is the sort of uh, later style 
It's the later style of box art and box presentation, in fact. Do we have a date? Do we have a date? I'm guessing it's about 83-ish. Let me just see. It should tell us, actually. I didn't check that. I'm pretty convinced it's around about the 83 mark. This. Oh! One thing I didn't show you was on the side. Which is quite a nice... I quite like the way they do this, actually. They show the unpainted version, completed. In a slightly cartoonish manner, but... Quite, quite accurate, you know, quite like that really. It's not too bad, is it? Yeah, you see how it's a bit of a strange odd design. It's like a mixture of other planes, really. I'm still trying to find the date. This says Matchbox is a train, but... Mm, this is definitely that era between about 83 and 85, I'm sure of it. Might be a little bit later. Some of you are probably looking it up on uh, scale mates as we speak. It's mid-late 80s anyway, I would say. Let's just pop that over there. And let's have a look at the plastic and um, instructions. So I've still got the sniffles a little bit. This warm, breezy weather we've got. Uh, give me trouble with hay fever. I'm sure a few of you are the same. So in the UK, anyway. I was hearing that, was it Dennis, one of the guys in Canada? He was saying it was pretty bad there. It was getting a bit out of control, the heat, you know. That time of the year, folks, isn't it? Northern Hemisphere is getting its full on summer. Oh, we've got a piece off the sprue here. Where's that from? Oh, there. Okay. Wasn't me, Gov, honest. It was like that when I found it, officer. <laughs> right, let's have a look at these decals. Let's have a look at this. Here we go. Douglas Sky Knight. I was trying to remember who the manufacturer was because they didn't tell us that initially. There we are. Um, now those decals for Matchbox look pretty good. There's, um, the only downside to them is that they've got a rather a thick halo of carrier film around them. Can you see that? A bit closer. Yes, the halo of carrier film around the actual decal. It's quite thick. It's about oh, it's two or three millimeters there, all the way around. It's quite a lot. It's interesting. The backing paper. It's oh, hang on a second. Chris, I think you've. I think Chris has looked in here. Oh, he's got two sets. I thought it was thick. How bizarre! That's very unusual. Matchbox quality control used to be very. You know, you never get any freebies in a matchbox like, like you did in Airfix sometimes. You've got two complete sets of uh, decals there. You've got one set that I can sell on eBay. I mean, Chris can sell on eBay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But how about that too? I thought it was very thick. So you got a bonus there. Two sets of decals so. Anybody needs a spare decals, I'm sure Chris will be happy to sell them to you. <laughs> well, let's, let's have a look at these instructions. Still got, actually, I quite like the way they presented this. It's quite, it's quite clear. I think it's going to be quite good. Okay. Right then. It says here, in response to a request for proposals for a carrier-based night fighter, night fighter, okay, Several designs were considered, but the Douglas submission was selected and orders were placed for three prototypes in April 46. Hell, this writing is small, folks. My glasses are struggling. I'm going to put my other glasses on. One second. <coughs> Sorry about this. We'll go to the reading glasses, I think. Let's go a little bit closer. That's better. Right. Yes, it was designated the XFD1. XF3D1. Necessity fitting a large radar dish antenna to give a direction, sorry, a detection range of 124 miles, together with the anti-icing cabin pressurisation. Uh, I think you might better if I zoom you back slightly while I'm reading this. You get a bit more, yeah, better of a visual thing. I'm not saying I'm good visually, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, Sophisticated navigational equipment required for this role of an all-weather fighter was also included, resulting in a large bulbous airframe with side-by-side -side seating. The first prototype flew in March 1948, but the definitive Westinghouse APQ-35 radar wasn't fitted until the third machine, which flew in October 48. This was powered by a J-34 WE-22 engine, giving £3,000 of thrust a novel feature of the aircraft was the escape system used, as the installation of ejector, ejector seats was not possible. Don't like the sound of this. What? <laughs> We're going to have something wacky, aren't we? Yeah, 
Yes, we are. A slide, a slide was built through the airframe behind the seats to break away to a breakaway hatch on the underside of the fuselage, just behind the nose wheel bay. The crew pivoting their seats and sliding down the chute feet first. Sounds like Thunderbirds, doesn't it? Only worse. <laughs> Squadrons began to receive the aircraft as the F3D1, with updated engines giving 3,250 pounds of thrust in December 1950. But although the Sky Knight has been intended and designed for carrier use with folding wings, it never actually saw service at sea. But was successfully used on shore bases in both the Korean and Vietnamese conflicts, creating a unique conflicts, um, which was a unique distinction of these aircraft. But the Sky Knight remained in service in the late 60s, but machines were still flying as late as 1983. Well, that's quite impressive, isn't it? Let's go back to the new glasses and everything. If you'll just excuse me one second. There we go, that's better. Right. Tax to the old eyes, that was a bit. So, crew of two, yeah, yeah, two 20mm cannons, external tanks, etc, etc, weapons. Let's have a look then at the instructions. Well, I quite like the way they've done this. It wasn't like the one we saw the other week where they'd made, was it the, Vic, the new Victor one where that... Um, I've been sent, um, was it John Harley, I'm trying to remember his name, uh, sent me the instructions all the way from Australia and they'd sort of done a hybrid version of the instructions but at least it was English. This is a bit more closer to the traditional style isn't it, where you can see they've got the paint guide below there and above it is the sort of the stencil stroke decal guide there. I've got to say the night fighter option looks quite cool. I think that would be the one I'd go for. So, oh, and here we are. Yes, we they still kept the small parts guide. I like this. I like the way they've done it. So you've got it here, the interior of the cockpit. And um, the walls of the cockpit, I should say. And the interior of the cockpit itself. Where well, you've got this, what is it, slide ejection system. That sounds all very dangerous to me. A mad idea. I don't know why they couldn't just have ejector seats. Because they were out by then, weren't they? Perhaps it was a little bit, perhaps they weren't considered reliable enough. Instrumentation here, I've got a rest of the hook here, which you're not going to need because you're not going to be able to carry it, but anyway. <laughs> and then you've got various small parts like the, um, I think the baffles, aren't they? And the uh, legs for the wheels, uh, main gear leg, nose gear leg, I think, nose gear leg there, wheel and tyres, another part of the gear, nose, that's the nose wheel, and then the jet pipes. Right, let's have a look at this. Oh, okay, it's in this matchbox oven style that goes vertical now. So I'll zoom back a bit for this one. Starting with our rather rudimentary seats and cockpit. Then for some bizarre reason you're building up the uh, drop tanks, which seems a very strange thing to do as a second stage, but anyway. Then we're going to build up the intakes, is that? Yeah, the air intakes for the jet engines, the uh, either side of the fuselage. Then the opposite end, the jet pipe at the back. Then we're going to bring uh, together the fuselage sides, putting in your cockpit, and then you're building up the sides, the, uh, sort of the bodywork that runs around the engines here. Nice and clear this one, I've got to say. And then you're building up this rather... Okay. <clears throat> Maybe this is part of the reason they couldn't have ejector seats. It's a very peculiar sort of glass house style canopy. <coughs> Excuse me. A very jet provost looking tail, tailplane, horizontal stabiliser, I should say. <coughs> oh boy. Then we've got our gear going in. Yeah. And then you're building, this is what it's just saying about you've got this, um, do they actually fold or not? No, you've either got straight, you've got the option there, you've got straight wings out or folded wings. A bit of a shame they didn't. And put it on a carrier. It's got a slight look of the sky ray about it at the front end, hasn't it? A little bit. Um, sky ray? I'm right, aren't I? What was the one they use in the bridges of Tokari? My memory's not very good. <coughs> the Korean War. Um, so you do the outboard and inboard, and then you've obviously got here showing the wings how they should be folded. 
And then we've got our undercarriage going in here, plus all the doors. There's quite a few of those. And then finally you've got your tanks. Are they tanks or are they bombs? They're bombs, aren't they? I think they're the bombs, not tanks. Yeah. Kind of hard to tell the design. And there we have it. So that's the instructions, which um, yeah, seem fairly clear. Did it mention weight in the nose to stop it being a tail sitter? They often don't in some of these. Did they mention it? Mm, sort of, yeah. They've got the, the arrow pointing down, which is not the clearest way of explaining it, but anyway. Quite decent instructions, I have to say. We will carefully return those along with the decals, the many, many decals within the spare set that Chris has got. I bet he didn't know that. He'll be chuffed as chips now that he's seen me open that because he now knows that it was in there at the beginning. He just didn't know about it. Right, so let's have a look. We've got three sprues, three colours. Grey, kind of a ghost grey and a dark grey. Sorry, white ghost grey and dark grey, I should say. Now, I've got to be honest that this is off the sprue. It's quite a weak sprue point. It's funny how Matchbox as they went later, they seem to go weaker with the sprue attachment points. I noticed that in a few other kits. Let's have a look. This rather intriguing aeroplane. I know one of you, Mr M, has been building this. I think he was having a bit of trouble. I think he had a few bad joins and you know, gaps and things. Perhaps he can tell us more where the issues were. Now there you have got this tail which reminds me of a... Uh, What's the uh, maritime aircraft? Is it the Neptune? Reminds me of that shape. Front reminds me of a Jet Provost, this bit. Yeah, it's a real mishmash of different designs, it seems to me. Because it may be that this came first, so we don't know. But anyway, there's your engine shrouds for the engines. There's your uh, gear bay doors, I think. You've got your exit pipes for the engines here. And then we've got the intakes here, and this is the one that's came off the sprue. I'll try and get a bit closer on this one for you. It's quite a nice shape to it, isn't it? It's quite a sculpt of the intakes. Very nice. Uh, as usual, there's no flash anywhere. We've got, um, I should have pointed this out, this is very much leaving the sprue. I'm getting nervous for this. <coughs> yeah. The two bottom sprue attachment points are not actually attached. That one or that one. So I'll try and be gentle, make sure no more comes off. Um, but you've got a tail, a two-sided tail design there. So it's the tail is on one side of the fuselage, but it has both sides of the tail, whereas here there's no tail. It should, in theory, give you less issues, but perhaps Mr Mummery can tell us more about that. Then we have got our clear parts. Let's have a look at these. This is this rather unusual glass house where you build the and again, that's coming off the sprue a lot. In fact, that's just held on by a thread. I'm going to be very gentle with this, Chris. It's only held on by this sprue attachment point at the bottom left. Gulp. <laughs> um, but it's weird because it's got like two sides, which look a bit like a Corsair canopy. And then you've got this glass house that goes in the middle, which is kind of weird. Very unusual. Most curious. But as usual, it's nice and clear, very bright looking. It's a little on the thick side for the scale, but very nice, very nice. Then we have got lots of ancillary bits and wings and things. Here we go. This is the dark grey sprue. So we've got the outer wing on, is it on the top or the bottom? Yeah, the top. So is it, this is, sorry, again. This is the underside, I should say, of the wing, because it's got the gear in, uh, the gear bay, as you can see here. So it's dark grey underneath and they put light grey on the top, which seems rather odd. Why have they done that? Is that correct? Yeah, it is. How odd. Strange choice. I would have put the dark grey on the top myself, but anyway. <coughs> there we are. You've got your fairly rudimentary seats. That looks a little bit odd. Is that a bit of a short shot? It's supposed to be like that. Can you see that? I'm going to try and zoom you in. I think we might have a, a matchbox short shot here, which is a bit unusual. Look at the headrest of the two seats. This one here doesn't seem to have been completed. It's like a short shot piece. How odd. Very unusual that on a matchbox kit. Bit of a miss mold there. Then you've got your wheels and tyres. And you've got your undercarriage legs. 
nose wheel there. As I said, you've got your inboard wing and then you've got your outboard wing tips here. So we've got a combination of recessed and uh, raised panel lines. Um, just a hint of flash, that's unusual as well. You can tell this is the later stages of Matchbox when they weren't quite so fussy. Very unusual, so you can see a little bit of flash there. Tiny bit, just hinting it is. A little hint of flash around that pylon. But uh, overall, very nice. And then, finally, we've got the rest. This tail plane, which looks remarkably like a Jet Provis, but is bigger in fairness. It's like a bigger, looks like a 48 scale Jet Provis tail, the elevators. Quite nicely figured though, quite nicely, uh, you know, the elevator cutout is done quite well, I'd say. Then you've got your, the top of your wingtips, the upper surface here. And the inboard top of the wings here. And these that we think are maybe bombs after all. They could be tanks, they could be bombs. I can't make my mind up at some point, honest, because they look awfully like, um, it could be napalm actually. Nasty. <coughs> Not sure what they are, to be honest. 100% sure. Plenty of fine parts. Yeah, it's quite nice. It's a bit. I don't know. There's not a lot of character on some of these parts. Although they have got this um, the detail on the wing, it's actually quite nice. The, uh, the raised panel lines do look. Quite sharp and quite they're not they're not steep, they they're not high. They are decent. So there we go, a little hint of flash here and there, so it's not quite as good as the earlier generations of matchbox, I don't think. Um, so where are we then with the Sky Knights? It's an unusual plane, it's not the prettiest aircraft ever, but uh, but it looks quite quite a stable looking plane. I think it's probably good that's why it's a good platform for training, obviously. So, what are we going to give this then? Um, instructions I thought were pretty good. Hmm, and it got, this one got two lots of decals. I'm going to give that... Uh, can I give it nine? Or is that too generous? Mm, I think nine's kind of fair really. You know? I think especially for the time, I think that's one of the better ones we've seen from that late 80s era matchbox. Uh, some of them are a bit ropey to be quite honest and some of the instructions are absolutely terrible. So the instructions have really helped it a lot by being so clear and nicely printed. Um, and yeah, I think they've done a good job with the artwork. Again, it would have been a better job if they haven't trimmed it as much. I think nine's kind of fair really. I think that's not too bad. Hope you agree. Don't think I was too generous. Perhaps David, who's been building this, can tell us what the issues are and what to watch out for in case Chris decides to go ahead and build it. That's where I'm kind of at. I hope that you're going to give me 10 out of 10 with a thumbs up. And don't forget to smash that like button. Uh, and if you're not a subscriber already, you must please ding the subscribe button and then you get to see the next video that comes up. Similar material, I'm sure. And uh, if you are a subscriber already, don't forget that the notification bell is the way to get the instant notification and gratification. Some of you have been complaining recently that you haven't been alerted that there was a premiere. Have you dinged the notification bell? I wonder. Hmm. Well, you better check. Make sure you've got that bell smashed. And there we go. Until next time then, folks. Hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much to Chris Downey for lending that to us. Really appreciate it, Chris. Uh, I'll put that carefully back in. I think we've minimised the disruption to the packaging as best we could. Bit of high precision surgeon work there for you. <laughs> Thanks a lot for lending it to us anyway, really appreciate that. We'll get that back to you very soon. In the meantime, until we have another one of these interesting uh, unveiling or unboxings for you to have a nosy at, thanks very much for joining me. Please all take care of yourselves. Thanks a lot and bye for now.